My name is George Makore. Um, I'm the Deputy Chief of Party for the USAID Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub, um, USAID Trade Hub for short. Uh, my role today is to welcome you uh, to this very critical um, webinar. Uh, one of the activities that we are uh, having today uh, in our efforts to ensure that we continue to facilitate, uh, identify tools, as well as uh, um, provide opportunity or an opportunity for cross pollination of ideas. Um, so um, before we go into the program for the day, I just thought that I needed to remind us on um, what the USAID trade up is all about. Who are we and what are our areas of operation, our objectives? We are a USAID funded project, uh, which is uh, uh, a five year project, uh, now uh, uh, going to be a six year project. Um, we are been, we have been in existence since October 2016. So uh, we are now in the fifth year of the six uh, years of project. Now, the what do we do uh, as a project? We have a number of activities that we cover uh, in eight of the 16 SADA countries we work in. The eight uh, SADA countries that work in are uh, led by South Africa. And then uh, we have the four other uh, SACO countries, which are uh, Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, and Namibia. And in addition to that, we also operate in Mozambique, Malawi, and Zambia. I, I like to uh, refer to us as the SACO plus three countries that we uh, focus on. So um, in the eight countries, we cover um, mainly um, increasing or um, working with countries or the seven countries outside South Africa to increase trade between those countries and South Africa. And this is uh, mainly aimed at increasing exports uh, based on um, a study or studies that we continue to carry out in terms of identifying where there is demand or what demand uh, exists in South Africa for products from the region, which we then um, uh, link up uh, those potential suppliers, with potential buyers in South Africa for those products for purposes of trade. The thinking behind uh, this is that uh, South Africa is, uh, is, is has a huge population, also has um, uh, quite uh, advanced technology in terms of uh, processing of products, and it often requires uh, products as raw materials uh, for further processing or export. So that's the thinking behind uh, this uh, idea of uh, finding products from the region that are required in South Africa uh, for either local consumption, further processing, export. Then the other uh, objective, our other objective is mainly uh, looking at all the eight countries that we operate in. And we try and uh, assist the companies in those countries that produce products uh, which are AGOA eligible, uh, African Growth and Opportunity Act. And we then um, link up producers with potential buyers of such products in the US to uh, increase utilization of the Agroa program. Then finally, our third objective, our objective is uh, looking at, uh, again, linked to the other objectives that I've just highlighted there, is looking at uh, where there is need for uh, uh, investment in terms of uh, uh, both uh, uh, capital and uh, technology transfer uh, within the seven countries that we operate in in the region. 
and uh, we then identify potential suppliers of that investment um, in South Africa, from South Africa who are, would be willing to extend their footprint into the region. And of course, we're looking at uh, the fact that most of most investors from outside our continent tend to first uh, uh, invest in South Africa and look for opportunities in the region. And we then, uh, uh, based on that thinking, we try and uh, assist the companies that will be looking at exporting more products into South Africa or to the US uh, that will be uh, looking for increased investment. We then link them up with potential investors. Those are our three main objectives as uh, the USAID Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub. So on today's program, um, we do have uh, um, very interesting uh, presentation, uh, very critical. In fact, um, over the years uh, when we have been working with countries and firms in the countries that we work in uh, to try and identify some of the challenges that they face, uh, this has been something that has been raised a number of times, uh, which is uh, a tool to facilitate trade uh, to make uh, suppliers uh, be able to understand how they can navigate uh, the issue of trade uh, when they are moving uh, or doing business uh, from uh, the region into South Africa. And we, we're going to have uh, a presentation from an expert uh, uh, for in that area, and hopefully we'll find this very helpful. Uh, what I will do is uh, um, I will hand you over um, just now to my colleague, uh, Francis uh, Fraser, uh, who is the portfolio manager for Botswana, Namibia, and Malawi uh, for the USAID trade-up. I'm sure most of you um, know her. She's the one who's going to be taking us through um, this webinar. And we will, like I said earlier, we will have a question and answer session uh, my next steps and closing remarks from uh, Cepiso. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just so that we know who is amongst uh, us, uh, we do have uh, a number of uh, uh, participants that uh, actually registered for this uh, session. And as I speak, I see we have actually hit the, almost hit 100 mark in terms of participants, uh, uh, Lesotho. Uh, so basically uh, all the countries that we operate in that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we are expecting uh, to have more than 180 participants uh, for this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, an indication of the uh, importance of um, the propriety of, of this particular Again, colleagues, if you could uh, uh, mute if you are not speaking, uh, because there is, can be some uh, feedback. Now, let me introduce you to our moderator for today's webinar. Our moderator, um, um, Reza, like I mentioned earlier, she has over 19 years of experience in international development. Uh, of mainly focusing on a market-based solutions to inclusive growth. So uh, Francis has uh, uh, been working um, with the USAID trade up for a number of years now. And uh, before she moved to cover or had the uh, our uh, Botswana, Namibia and Malawi cluster, which used to be have actually uh, had an opportunity to interact with Francis. Francis, um, over to you, uh, take us through. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, George, for the warm introduction and for getting our session started. Um, if I could please just ask any participants to also turn off their videos if you're not um, asking a question. And um, if I could ask any research 
myself was just to keep to keep ready to mute participants as they join the Zoom. So I think it's happening that people join their mic and on and we're getting a bit of disturbance there. Um, so please, let's try and keep microphones muted, everyone. Um, so first thing is that this is a two-part series. Uh, today is the first of two webinars that we're carrying out on the subject of importing into South Africa. And so it's important that today we're setting the foundation and in a week's time, there'll be a second session that focuses in more detail on aspects of contracting, INCO terms and financing. So if you're wanting to get into depth in terms of some of those topics, please make sure to register for the session next week. Then uh, a few housekeeping arrangements. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website um, after the event. So please uh, don't worry if you miss something or if your connection drops, this will be recorded. And the presentation will also be shared with everyone who registered for the event. So you don't need to frantically keep notes. Uh, you will receive a copy of the presentation. As George already mentioned, please feel free to already post questions you might have into the chat box so that we can field those to Mary um, as soon as she has completed her presentation. Uh, please could we have the next slide? Thanks for your way. So Mary Gounder is somebody who has vast experience in terms of some of the intricacies of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, Mary joined us on a consulting assignment in December at the USA Trade Hub to develop the cross-border toolkit. Um, the toolkit focuses on exporting out of the seven countries that we work in and importing into South Africa. So um, that's the focus of the content for today. And uh, Mary spent the last few months in consultation with many of you in terms of some of the areas um, that you would like to know more about. What are the things that have tripped you up if you're an exporter? Uh, what are the things that you actually would make this whole process a lot easier in terms of um, importing into South Africa? She's got hands-on experience having been a consultant in maritime logistics and having worked for AP Muller Mercer Group. She's also lectured at the Durban Inst uh, University of Technology. Um, so it's, it's great to have Mary on board to share her knowledge with us uh, after the last few months of work that she's been doing uh, with the USA Trade Hub and our partners. With that, Mary, I know you would like to share your screen. So, Renilwe, um, you can hand control to Mary so she can just get her presentation up and running. Uh, Mr. Tusubile, if you could maybe just uh, kill your video for us. And Mr. Mazengo, uh, just so we can have the full advantage of the screen from Mary. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Mary Ganda. Over to you, Mary. Thank you, Francis, for a warm welcome. And it's been a pleasure working with the team over the last few months. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. I will be switching off my video for the rest of my presentation just to make sure that everyone can hear what I'm saying and that there are no issues um, with your bandwidth and um, that sort of thing. Okay, so I've spent the last few months working with the USA Trade Hub and working with the different offices. Um, and we have been looking at what exactly is needed for the toolkit. Okay, So for the presentation that I'm going to be doing now, this is just a presentation outline. So we'll go through the introduction of the background for the toolkit and the methodology with finding the information. Um, a bit of the country profiles and the type of commodities we'll be looking at. Um, we'll also be looking at export readiness, the exporter registrations that you'll need to do when starting to export, um, the export process and the import process, and the different types of documentation you will need. Uh, we'll just touch on the INCO terms and contracts and the payment methods, um, because this will actually be covered in our next presentation, which will be next week. And then we will look at this commodity specific requirements, which is something that has um, come up over and over again during my interviews with the stakeholders that this is something that they need to know, that they need to learn about and understand. Okay, so 
we started with a regional cross-border toolkit with looking at how can we increase exports to South Africa from Southern African countries. And the USA Trade Hub had had a few meetings with the stakeholders prior to me coming on board. And one of the things that they have you know, stressed is that they need to know the processes of exporting to South Africa because you know people have started exporting and have come up with a lot of issues um, and challenges. So what we are looking at to look at what are those issues, what are those challenges? And where can we actually meet, you know, um, the stakeholders, you know, at some point to give them that information that they need in advance. So before you start exporting, let's look at the type of information that you need, the type of requirements that South Africa requires for people who are importing into South Africa. Um, and look at if these things can be done before you can, before you start your exports. The methodology for finding all this information was the stakeholder engagement. So we sent out surveys and we've done interviews. Um, I'd like to pause here and just thank every single person that has taken the time to participate in this uh, process. I know it was a bit tedious filling out a survey. We all get a bit frustrated and the, some of the questions were quite in-depth. So I really want to thank every single person that's taken the time um, to fill out the survey and those who have actually taken the time to sit with me and chat with me about all the challenges and what they are going through and the types of businesses that they are running. Um, and for me, all the interviews were really, really interesting because it is so important to get information from people who are literally on the ground, who are trying to export and listening to you and understanding where you're coming from with your frustrations and looking at you know some people have found their own solutions so you know these are things that we can actually pass on to people who are struggling as well so that time you took to actually uh, meet with me i am really really appreciative of and i think it's information that we can use and we have used to actually develop the toolkit and this is information that not only you can use but everyone else who needs to export to South Africa. The other part of the information and the research was the desktop research, where I've gone to different countries' websites and their requirements and their processes um, for trading um, within the SADC region and the different benefits and that sort of thing. Um, so it was a lot of time just spent on researching and um, engaging with the different stakeholders. So the main country that we were focusing on obviously would have been in South Africa and importing into South Africa. And the export countries were Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, and Zambia. So I have met with people from every single one of these countries um, and as many stakeholders as we could get on board to um, do the surveys, to sit with us during the interviews. Um, we have met with anyone and everyone who was available. Um, so I am thankful for those who have made the time. For Botswana, the type of products that we are looking at focusing on for the cross-border toolkit, we meat products, textiles, um, salt, handicrafts, um, eswatini. Um, some of the products were macadamia nuts, honey, textiles, um, bananas, handicrafts, and Lesotho. Uh, we were looking at textiles and apparel, bottled water, medicinal plants, handicrafts, accessories, and PPE. Malawi was mainly groundnuts, macadamia, sugar beans, tea, and coffee. And Mozambique, we focused on also the same sort of agricultural products like groundnuts and cashew nuts, um, fish, specialized beans, coffee, moringa, Namibia. We looked at the apparel, salt, olive oil, dates, raisins, and table grapes. And Zambia, we were looking at medicinal plants, sugar beans, fish, honey, handicrafts, and accessories. So we've gone through looking at all these different commodities um, that some of the exporters would like to export to South Africa. And then we started looking at what are the import requirements within South Africa. And we found, you know, South African rules can be quite stringent. Um, and that was one of the main findings, you know, that people have had while they've tried to export. 
Um, so we'll go to that and we'll touch on that sort of information towards the end where we look at the commodity specific requirements. Uh, but we have researched you know, every single commodity to see what are the requirements, what's needed from South Africa side and, you know, um, you know, the type of import permits you need, whether or not you need import permits, the type of inspections that you will um, have to go through when exporting to South Africa, um, things that the importers will need to know and, you know, be ready for those extra costs and the extra processes. But what I have tried to do is look at it from the export point mainly, because, you know, during your export, um, when you are exporting, you are literally just preparing everything. And the more preparation that's done on the export side, the easier the import side happens to be. Um, so that is why I focused a lot on the exports. Okay, so moving on to exports. Now, the first thing that any company that wants to export you need to actually look at your export readiness. And I've chatted to companies that have already started exporting, and I've spoken to companies who are looking to export. And for me, the main preparation is to be with the business itself and the product readiness. How can you assess your business and check whether it's ready for export? Now, when you're dealing with your business within your own country or as I put it domestically you will find that you do not have to follow as many regulations as you would if you have to export cargo right so let's just say you've set up your business and you know you are running a you know you've got a sugar beans company and you're providing sugar beans for your local market and it's actually doing quite well and then you decide okay well the business is actually doing quite well, so I would like to start exporting. And then you get an order from South Africa. And, you know, you decide to send the order, you do your normal um, forms and documents. So you've got your commercial invoice, your packing list, um, your transport documentation, and then you've exported it to South Africa. And then the importer gets it and the container is stopped or the shipment is stopped. And it's stopped for a few weeks because, you know, you may actually need a permit for this. Um, and, you know, there's extra costs with, um, with um, the Department of Agriculture actually inspecting it. Because once a car the cargo comes into South Africa, you know, if the Department of Agriculture or Customs wants to inspect your shipment, it has to go in a specific warehouse and you need to pay for that storage while they're at the warehouse. So all of these costs just start to add on. So before you actually start exporting, you know, you need to look at, you know, your business readiness. So some of the things to look at is your commitment for export. Now, why commitment is so important is that, you know, when you're running your business locally, you get your sorry, a sale very quickly. You know, you go and visit a um, supermarket, they say yes or no. You go and visit the next supermarket, they say yes or no. But when you are dealing with international exports and international buyers, that commitment takes time for somebody to actually say, yes, I want to order from you. So you may have to go to trade shows. You have to spend a lot of time emailing back and forth, calling people, trying to get that sale. So it could take months. It could even take years. So that is why there is that commitment, not only with the time, um, with your resources um, and especially financial resources. So you need to look at do you really have that amount of time and energy to actually commit to exporting? The other thing to look at is your management skills. Um, and is the management used to exporting? Do you have um, you know, skilled people who, are, uh, who have worked internationally, who have exported or imported internationally um, to help with the processes? Um, then you've got to look at your financial resources, which is obviously one of the most important resources for any business. Um, because when you're looking at financial resources, you are looking at your transport costs. Are you looking at things that may go wrong with your shipment? You may be looking at your buyer not actually paying you in the long run, or the delivery doesn't get happen, and then you have you do not may not have insurance. So you need those financial resources as a buffer. So should anything go wrong, do you have the money to keep running your business, even domestically? 
uh, technical expertise um, in looking at uh, what kind of technical expertise do you need to know with your product, um, the type of expertise that you need to know with your exporting your product to another country, and your supply capacity. So when I'm talking about supply capacity, if you have a factory and you have this huge order that suddenly comes in from South Africa, do you have the machinery? Do you have the laborers? And do you have the money to buy the um, goods to actually make the product? So if you are making t-shirts, do you have enough money to buy enough material to make the product for that order? Um, so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about supply capacity. Do you have that capacity to supply internationally? Because internationally, you may get bigger orders. And that may actually put aside your domestic work. So it's things that you need to think about. Um, then you've got your international market intelligence. And this is where we are trying to help you with understanding what the market is like in South Africa, what the processes that you'll need to follow when exporting to South Africa. OK, moving on to product readiness. Now, one of the first things to look at is how successful is your product in the local market? Because if, you're su if you are successful, then that means you are making money and then you have the potential to find international buyers. Um, then you've got to look at your product adaptability. Does your product need to be adapted to the international market or to another country's standards? Uh, because a certain standard may be acceptable in your country, but it may not be acceptable in another country. So you really need to look closely at your product. Does it need to be improved? Do you need to add more technology? Do you need to look at the quality? Do you need to look at the um, packaging of your product? And that's where you'll start looking at whether or not your product really is ready for the export market. And your cost structure, when we're looking at cost structure, we're looking at where are you sourcing your raw materials from? If you're sourcing your raw materials locally, then it's easier to understand your own cost structure and that you do not have the same issues as you know, importing your raw materials. Because if you are importing your raw material, then you actually have to sit and um, really stress about the rate of exchange because whether or not the rate of exchange goes up or down, you're going to be stressing either way. So, and these are costs that we do not normally look at, but it's important to actually understand that, you know, when you are importing, that rate of exchange is a big player uh, with your costs. Looking at your competitors, and we're not looking at local competitors, I'm looking at international competitors. So if you want to export um, tomatoes to South Africa, um, and as I've spoken to someone in Eswatini, there's no point in exporting tomatoes to South Africa because we have a very big tomato market, we've got a very big agricultural sector, and it's very hard to compete with the South African market. So you need to understand when you are exporting to the different countries, who are your competitors there? And are there other countries that also export to South Africa? Your, the very same product that you are exporting. So when you look at something like textiles, okay, Botswana wants to export textiles to South Africa. Lesotho wants to export textiles. Malawi wants to export textiles. Um, and then it becomes a price fight, really. So who actually are your competitors? So you're not looking at within your own market. You're looking at, you know, internationally. Who are your neighbors? Um, what are they exporting to South Africa? Um, and can you actually compete with that? The last part of your product readiness is your product complexity. Now, this is where you look at your product ad adaptability. Also, what are the resources needed to use your product? So if your product is machinery, is this a specific amount of power that you need to use for that machinery? Um, do you need to actually provide spare parts? Do you need to provide after-sales service like repairs? Um, and the more complex the product, the harder it will be to sell because when you're selling to a different country, do you have the manpower in that country to actually deal with all the issues that may happen? 
but especially when it comes to things like machinery. Um, so these are the things that you need to look at for your export readiness. Now, you may not have everything ready, okay? No company really has, and even some of the biggest companies uh, may not have all their ducks in a row to export. But it's a working progress. So I'm not saying, oh, if you don't meet these requirements, you cannot export, okay? You may have a product that's easy to export, right? So you just need to actually understand where you, where you stand with the exports, uh, where your business is, and know what risks you're willing to take for that business. Um, so you may not meet all the requirements, but you will never know how well your product will do until you actually start exporting and finding buyers and you actually start going to trade shows to look at what the competitors' products are like, um, what products you can actually offer. Um, so there may be some really good products that you have to offer. So the only way to understand where you stand is to actually do that research by being out there, by meeting buyers, um, and by attending webinars like this where, you know, the USA Trade Hub basically gets you together. And you can actually ask your questions and, you know, find out, you know, are there people who would be interested in these products? Okay. And moving on to exporter registrations. Now, let's just say, yes, you've decided you want to export one of the most important things is getting your registrations in order so yes you'll have your business registration but every exporter in no matter which country you are in you most likely will need to have your separate exporter registration a lot of the times this is with customs or it could be that with the department of trade and industry so that will be dependent on the country that you are in now, if you are exporting to any country within the SADC region, you will require a certificate of origin. And that certificate of origin, you will most likely get from your Chamber of Com Commerce. So you will have to be registered with your Chamber of Commerce, and they will probably come and um, have a look at your premises, have a look at your product, and then say, okay, it is a product that is manufactured here in Botswana or here in Malawi. And yes, we can do the certificate of origin for you, okay? Then you have your product specific registrations. Now, if you're exporting agriculture product, you will have to register with the Department of Agriculture. If you are exporting uh, forestry products, you'll have to register with the Department of Forestry. If you're exporting meat products, you'll have to um, register with the state vet because they will have to provide you with your vet certificates, your phytosanitary certificates, and so on. So it will take time. Um, and this is, but this is a very, very important step because when you are more ready to export, you must have all these documents ready for exporting. So you must have your business registration, your exporter registration, your certificate of origin, your phytosanitary certificates, so you have to have everything ready and in place for you to export. So if you are looking to export, start looking at what your requirements are for the commodity that you want to export, what registrations you need to do, and start working on those. Even if you have, don't have a buyer, that's fine. Because once you do have a buyer, you must be ready to provide them with all the right documents and be able to ship your product. And the other part is actually developing relationships with key role players. Now, your role players is obviously one would be yourself, who is the exporter. Then you'd be the buyer. The other very important role player is your freight forwarder. Now, you could have a transporter that transports your cargo from Malawi to South Africa, but you will need a clearing uh, agent who is also a freight forwarder and they will actually help you clear your documents through to customs. Now, everything that goes out of uh, past your borders has to go through customs. You have to pull out your um, bills of entries and exit, and you as the exporter, you will most likely not be specialized in doing these documents and processing these documents. And that is why you need to find a freight folder as early as possible to say, listen, I need to export to South Africa. I need to know what are the costs for exporting to South Africa. So if I want to transport a truck full of sugar beans to South Africa, 
How much will you charge me? Uh, what will the documentation cost uh, for you to process it with custom? What are the additional costs that I may have? And a lot of times a freight forwarder will be able to assist you with this sort of information. And that is why it's so important to have that relationship with your freight forwarder. Then you've got to look at your bank, your ex uh, the exporter's bank, because these are the people who are funding your yeah. exports. Okay. And they are the people that you need, really need to have a very good relationship with. Um, so you actually know the processes, and in some cases you may need a letter of credit. Um, so you need to start asking them now, what is the process for the letter of credit? Uh, if you are my bank, how much does it cost for me to process a letter of credit and so on? And then you've got your buyer's notify party. So the buyer's notify party may be an agent or it may be a freight forwarder. The idea behind this is that you need to be talking, okay, because you need to have as much information as possible. You need to be communicating with everyone and getting that information that they need. Um, and it has to be consistent. Um, so, you know, trade is literally about relationships. It's about building trust relationships. It's not saying, oh, wait, I'm, I've got a one-off sale here and it doesn't matter. Every sale matters. Every relationship matters. So you need to take that time to understand who you want to build relationships with and where you want to take those relationships in, you know, when it comes to your exporting business. And then you've got your export process. So let's just say you've been to one of the trade shows and someone has asked you to quote. Okay. Now, one of the things that you need to include in your quote is your product cost. So how much are you charging them for per unit or per box or you know per package, uh, depending on how you, how you package your goods? Um, the other would be your insurance costs. Um, and this is something, you know, either your bank or your paid forwarding agent can help you with. Um, the transport costs and any other costs that you may actually um, foresee with exporting um, goods. So you need to make sure that you're including as much as possible in your quote, as much information. Um, the other thing is lead time. So how long from the time I ask you for a quote, or how long from payment? Or once your the order has been confirmed, how long do I have to wait for the goods that I've ordered from you? Okay. In some cases, you may already have goods in stock. In other cases, you may have to manufacture, right? So if you need to manufacture, you need to look at how long does it take you to get your raw materials? Um, how much of time will it take to actually manufacture the goods? Um, and then looking at what is the in the longest time it will take you to get me to deliver the goods to me. OK, this can be a week, two weeks, a month, whatever it is, you need to be upfront about it. OK, you need to be as honest as possible and as upfront so we do not have any issues later on. So I cannot come back to you and say, hey, but you told me it would be two weeks and now it's a month later. And a month later, I want to actually cancel the order. So you'd rather tell me it's going to be a month and I know it's a month and I'm happy to order it knowing full well that I'm going to wait one month for this order. But, you know, it will be of good quality and it will be what I want. Um, so that is why you need to actually be as upfront, especially with lead times on your quotes. OK, then you need to actually look at how you're selecting your clearing and forwarding agent. You need to look at the services that you want. Do you want them to transport your goods? Do you want them to do the documentation, um, such as your customs clearance? Uh, you will have to look at how much they charge. You will have to look at the relationships that they have. Do they have agents in South Africa? Do they have their own offices in South Africa? So these are different things that you need to look at. Um, obviously, cost is one of the main things, but you also want someone who's reliable and who has been in the business for years and years. Uh, because you do not want somebody who just opened their business um, and may not know how to handle your goods. Because remember, I'm still waiting for my cargo from you. So if you do not have a good clearing and forwarding agent or who you know cannot transport the goods, 
that may delay the cargo even more. And it's something you may not have any control over once you've given them the job. Okay, so right up front, when you're looking for a clearing and folding agent, make sure that whatever you are sending goods to, they have an office there or they can tell you who their agent is in South Africa or whichever country you are exporting to. Okay, now looking at your pro forma invoice. Okay, so once I, you, I've accepted the quote, you can send me a pro forma invoice. So your pro forma invoice should include as much information as possible. So we are looking at, um, you know, who, your details. Um, if I'm the buyer, we're looking at my details, um, the freight folders details, um, your transport agent, the product details, including the HS code, which is the code that we use for customs. Okay, so the packaging details, handling specifications. So if things need to be handled with care, um, you need to state it. Okay, um, if it has to be uh, refrigerated, it has to be stated. Okay, um, your lead time again, your pricing, and this is where you need to look at your income terms. Okay, so you will look at your cost of product, your pricing on, based on the income term you're using. Um, and the income term is just looking at your responsibilities and rights up to a certain point. And income terms, I'm not going to go into it right now. We will be looking at it next week. Okay, and then you also will, in your pricing, you will also include your bank costs, your currency for payment and so on. Um, the transport, the delivery address based on the income term, where are you delivering and what mode of transport are you using? The payment method and the terms of payment. Then you've got your insurance um, and the cost for those, for the insurance itself. Then you've got to process your export order. Now, when you're processing it, once I've said, okay, I'm happy to perform my invoice, I'm ready to put down a deposit so that you can start my order or whatever payment method we have agreed on. Um, then you actually need to go back to my order and actually make sure that, you know, you've got it according to what I wanted. So if I ask for blue t-shirts, I expect blue t-shirts. Um, if I asked for coffee packaged in a certain way, that is what I will expect. So you need to make sure that that order that you're sending me is exactly according to what I've stipulated in my requirements. Um, then you may have to prepare your shipping documents. Your shipping documents is your commercial invoice, um, which will obviously all that information will come off your pro forma invoice. Your packing list, which will, in, which will describe the product, how it's packed, um, and all the relevant information from there. And then you've got your transport waiver, which you'll get from your clearing and folding agent or your logistics company that you're using. Your exchange control forms, which you'll have with your reserve bank to say, okay, this is the amount of money I'm expecting in US dollars and any permits that's required for your shipment. So we're looking at your import permits or export permits, your phytosanitary um, and any other documentation that actually is relevant. Um, then receiving payment, you need to present the documents. Um, if you're dealing with a letter of credit, you'll be presenting the documents to your bank um, who will check your documents. And remember, when you're dealing with letters of credit, every single bit of information on your document has to be completely correct. And it has to be exactly as it is stipulated on your letter of credit. And we'll cover this next week in more detail. Okay, and then we are looking at your after sale service. Okay, so part of that export process is when the goods have been delivered, you, you know, pick up the phone or you email me and say, Mary, are you happy with your order? Um, is there anything that's missing or is there any problems? Um, you know, you know, we're looking forward to your next order and so on, because your after sale service would actually tell me whether or not I want to continue doing business with you. Okay, moving on to imports. Now, as I've stated before, I have not focused as much on imports because a lot of the preparation is done during your export process. And what, if the export process is done correctly, 
there's not as much work to be done on the import side. Okay, so for an importer, you know, you need to do your normal. If you're in South Africa and you want to import from Malawi, or if you want to import from Botswana, whatever products they may be offering, um, you obviously would have your normal import register, uh, your normal business re registration with CRTC. If you want to import, you register with customs as an importer, where you'll get an importer's code. And you as well will need to have a relationship with a clearing and folding agent because you will not be able to clear your cargo by yourself. Okay, only clearing and folding agents are allowed who are registered with customs can clear your cargo for you, right? And then your in import clearance, you've got to make sure that you know exactly how much your customs duties are and what your HS codes are for that product. So every single product. So if I've got macadamia nuts, now I don't have just one HS code for macadamia nuts. There's different ma uh, codes. So if it's um, raw macadamia nuts, okay, there's an HS code. If it's roasted macadamia code, uh, macadamia nuts, it's another HS code. So you need to make sure you're using the correct HS code. And sometimes, um, depending on how much processing is done, if you're using the right code, then you know you don't have to worry about inspections. But when you are exporting um, agricultural products to South Africa, especially raw products, um, you should be expecting um, inspections from uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, Agriculture and um, Health, Pot Health. Okay, the documentation as an importer, you'll need your commercial invoice, you'll need your packing list, transport label, exchange control forms, and your permits. So if you are in Botswana and you're exporting to South Africa, if I'm the importer, I need to actually contact the Department of Agriculture here uh, to make sure that the product doesn't need an, a permit. And if it does need a permit, I need to fill in the correct details. Um, these forms we will add on to the toolkit so you are aware. And on the forms, you'll have the contact details for the departments um, in South Africa. Okay, and remember when you're dealing with permits, these have to be done before the shipment has been moved. So before you actually even start your shipment, make sure you're starting your process for the permit itself. Whatever a permit is required, you cannot export it until it's if until you have that permit. Because if it comes into South Africa, it will be stopped. There is no doubt about it. You may get a fine or the cargo may be destroyed. So you need to actually do this work beforehand and you have to wait at least up to 30 days for those permits. Um, so, and it's 30 working days usually. So it does take time, but if you, if you do it in advance, um, the permits are valid for a year. So you need to make sure, okay, if you have a consistent buyer, you need to make sure that there's enough volume of cargo on it to make sure that you know if you have other shipments it's covered and then you may actually have to look at shipments that stop for inspection and each inspection agency may have a different process but generally they want the same documents that you've used for your export your commercial invoice your packing list your transport label um, your permits which is the most important part okay and then they will go inspect your cargo check if it's in line with all the documents your customs clearance documents, um, and then they will, if it all ties up, then they will release your cargo. But remember, whether or not they release the cargo, the importer or whoever's, depending on the inquiry, you will be liable for those costs. So the cost of the storage at whichever warehouse they've to asked you to put it in, um, and any other cost for the inspections, those you will be liable for. So you. Whenever you see that there is an inspection, please make sure that you have an understanding of what the cost may be. And that's where your clearing and folding agent will come in. Then you've got your import permits. Okay, so your import permits, as I've said before, you will need to get 
the buyer to get involved with us. So they will need to fill out the forms and send it to state vet here in South Africa or the Department of Agriculture and make sure that they get the permit before the shipment is moved. Okay. So Inca terms is your international commercial terms. Now this provides internationally accepted definitions and rules of interpretation for commercial terms using contract for the sale of goods. Now that's a mouthful. Um, so what we'll be doing next week is we'll be simplifying Inca terms. Um, what we've done with the toolkit is find a simpler way for you to understand Inca terms. So we literally have an Excel sheet that you can select your Inca term that you want to use, and then you'll say, okay, as the exporter or as the seller, this is what I'm responsible for, and this is what the buyer is responsible for. But let me mention one thing, regardless of what the Inco term is, as a seller, you will be responsible for those documents, okay? Your commercial invoice, <laughs> your packing list, and any mm -hmm. other export documents, okay? And your Inco terms will look at understanding the roles and responsibilities of the seller and the buyer, okay? So that will be covered fully next week. Your payment methods as well. So you've got different types of payment methods. You've got your cash in advance. You've got your letters of credit, documentary collections, open account, and usually with new uh, sellers and buyers, they usually opt for letters of credit, but these can be time consuming and quite expensive as well. But we will look at me payment methods in detail also next week, as well as your contracts. So how you go about starting your contract. And let me tell you this, a contract is not a normal written contract when you look at an international sale. All your emails that you've sent back and forth discussing how the shipment will be done, that's also part of your contract. Every time you know you go back to your, if I'm the buyer and you tell me, okay, Mary, I'm going to deliver at in Johannesburg, and this is the address I will deliver at. That is part of our contract right now. Okay. And this is the cost of me, of the cargo right up until Johannesburg. So I can always go back and say, but this is what you stipulated. This is part of our contract. So these are things that we will be looking at next week. Okay. And now the most important part, which everyone has been looking for, um, and that's your commodity specific requirements. Um, so we've looked at the different commodities. So Yes, groundnuts was one of it, um, macadamia nuts, cashew nuts, soya beans. Right. When you are moving cargo uh, within the SADC region, you are not liable for customs duties, okay, unless otherwise specified. Now, for all of these, you do not have to pay customs duties at all, okay, except for. Um, table grapes from, from Namibia um, to South Africa, but that we'll discuss a bit later. So generally, you are basically, your importer will literally have to just pay VAT, and VAT is calculated as 15% of your FOB value. We'll go back to the Inca terms you know, next week. Um, plus your duty, so you have no duties, plus excise. Now, excise is for luxury goods. So things like cosmetics, okay, excise may apply. So if you are charged excise, so that 15% will be FOB value plus um, excise plus fuel tax and 10, plus 10% 10 of your FOB value, okay? Now, if you are part of Botswana, Lesotho, um, Namibia, or Swaziland, known as Eswatini, you do not have to worry about that 10% FOB value, okay? But this is how your VAT is calculated. And then a note is all wood packaging material entering into South Africa has to be treated and marked in accordance with ISPM 15, right? Right, so whatever your product is, you will be paying VAT. So do not assume that because customs duty is not applicable, uh, you don't have to pay anything, you have to pay back. Then you've got 
license requirements. Um, so I've just put here yes or no or, or not applicable. So there's quite a few products where you need licenses. And when we are looking at the toolkit in detail, when you it's actually been published, we will tell you exactly which departments need those licenses. Right. Okay. Inspections. So we've also highlighted which products need inspections. So some products like sources, you do not need an import permit, permit because it is processed, but you will have an inspection. Okay, so you will have to look at making sure that you have enough funds for that inspection, depending on how long. So that is why you need all your documents in order. Okay, so depending on the product, you may need your import permit as well as you will be inspected, right? Um, things like honey, imported honey must be irradiated or regularized. Um, textiles and apparel, you have tariff rate quotas, which may apply. So your tariff rate quota is basically the amount of cargo that we are allowed to accept from different countries. So maybe from um, Zambia, it might be 500,000 tons, maybe from Malawi, 700,000 tons. And this will be specific to the HS code. So if you are exporting textiles and you are exporting women's dresses um, and it's made of cotton and so on. So based on that HS code, a different tariff rate may apply. So that is where your clearing and holding agent may come in and say, okay, if you're above that tariff quota, the country is above the tariff quota, anything above that may have an additional um, rate that you need to pay or fine that you need to pay, okay? Table grapes from Namibia specifically, um, other countries, are they do not have customs duties, but specifically from Namibia, you may have customs duties. Um, and this is with the new African Free Trade um, Agreement. Uh, so that's excluding the static region. You may actually have customs duties there. Coffee, you may have an import prohibition, um, but it depends on how the coffee has been treated or if there's anything added onto it and so on. So we will actually state that on the toolkit that these are the prohibitions and you need to be aware. And cosmetics, um, you will need an import permit depending on what the ingredients are and excess may apply, right? Handicrafts, um, you generally don't need to worry if it's plastic beaded stuff, but if you're looking at um, leather handicrafts, then you might need to get state vet involved. Um, so every single bit of cargo that you are exporting, you need to know what are the requirements. So all of these products where it says um, yes for permits, uh, you'll need to contact either the state vet or Department of Agriculture in South Africa, and that's your importer will need to do. Um, we do have the forms that need to be filled out, um, the, which we'll be adding to the toolkit. So these are things that you need to be aware of right now because then you know, okay, uh, it may be 30 days till we get an import permit and obviously we need to have the buyer available and, you know, we can work with the buyer to get that. And, but that has to be done before you start shipping your cargo. Okay, so all of these things. Um, this is really, really important information because if you are an exporter and you have any of these products, Offhand, you know, okay, if I'm exporting dates to South Africa, dates, I may not need an, uh, a permit, but it might actually get um, inspected when it gets into South Africa. So all agricultural products, you need to be aware of the um, inspections. Um, the other cost you need to find yourself of is the VAT. And if any other excise or any tariff uh, quotas are involved, okay? And if you are using wood packaging, this is a requirement. Uh, wood packaging has to be treated. Um, and we will be adding on the actual uh, requirements with that wood treatment. Okay, so that's the commodities. Your next step is basically to understand the process that needs to be followed for your specific commodity. 
So find out as much information as possible. Look at the, if you want to export to South Africa, uh, we can provide you with a certain amount of information. And, you know, USA Trade Hub is working on uh, building relationships between buyers and sellers and trying to find new buyers here in South Africa. But ultimately, you will need to take responsibility for this and go to trade shows. Um, you know, join different trade hubs um, or online trade websites, um, things like Trade Key. You know, you've got in China, you've got Alibaba. In, in Swaziland, I think you've got Buy Eswatini. So different countries may have different um, web pages that you could register on or different platforms that you can register on. Start working on looking at all of that. Um, build relationships with key role players. Start talking to clearing and forwarding agents. Start talking to your Department of Agriculture, um, your state vet, and anyone that's necessary for your shipments to take place. Um, so you find out as much information as possible. Start getting your registrations done. The other thing is attend relevant meetings. If you've got free information like this that people are offering you, just attend where you can and learn as much as possible. You do not need to be a specialist to export, but it's good to understand the process. I mean, you will have a specialist helping you, but you know sometimes um, even the specialist may make mistakes. So it's good for the exporter to, to understand the process themselves. The other thing is focus on your core business. Focus on your product that you're offering, and things like transport. Yes, that can be delegated. Your clearing and folding that should be delegated. Um, your core business, looking at the quality of your product, looking at the packaging, those are the things you need to look at. What are the options? Um, and the other thing is invest time and money in building your export business. It takes a long time. It takes time to build relationships. Um, I've been trying to help some of the exporters, I mean, with our Department of Agriculture. But let me tell you, it's been weeks where I've been going back and forth, getting information, passing it on. It does take a lot of time. So you need to have that commitment to work on it and to keep working on it. Um, it will get frustrating at times because not everyone will be helpful. Um, so you're, that's where your, you know, your relationships come in, where you, if someone's not helping you, you ask someone else for help or you know, find different people who may have relationships that you don't. So ultimately, work on your export business. Um, you know, put in the time, put in the effort. Um, we will try and offer as much information as possible um, to help you make things work. Um, and if you have any questions, please um, add it on the chat. And wherever possible, we can try and answer your questions now. If not, um, you have country representatives. Please send your questions to them, or if there's anything that you need to address to them, please do so. Okay, thank you very much for listening and for attending the webinar. I will pass this back on to uh, Francis. Thank you, Mary. Wow. Um, since we have this cool function to applaud, please can everyone give Mary a warm round of applause? That was very informative. Um, I think if anyone wants to post questions on the uh, on screen, if you'd like to come onto screen, please put up your hand and I will come to you as as soon as uh, as soon as I can field the questions. Um, Tekla, I saw your hand first. Do you still have a question that you would want to post to Mary? Please introduce yourself. Say which which country you're from? Yes, um, I did post a question on the chat, but basically it was to say, um, well, thank you for the lovely presentation. Just one thing that I wanted to inquire on is on the on the tariff quota that may be in place by the importing country. And she made an example of the um, outfits of the dresses that depending on the HS code, um, a country may decide that they are only importing X amount from uh, this country. Um, as an individual company, as an individual firm, how do I check if the country, if South Africa has reached um, its quota on, on the government or on the product that I want to uh, export to them? If they're all 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Great. Um, Mary, do you want me to ask a few questions and then you can collect your thoughts while I do that? Um, I can actually uh, answer this. Um, look, it's very hard to find the information because you would need to go onto our customs website and you'd firstly need to know what the quota is. Um, so if you have a specific uh, product that you're exporting, I think just send it through to me or to um, your country representative to pass on to me and I'll try and find the information. Or you can, the best bet is to get a clearing and folding agent who can speak to customs on your behalf. But generally this information is not actually sent out. Um, it's literally, you know, once you actually have exported, then you find out. But the quotas are there. We are aware of what it is, and I can find that information for you. Um, and we can look at what has been exported to South Africa, let's just say for 2021. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, I don't know if you would like to put your video on. It would be nice to see you. And then if I can ask people who are not speaking, uh, if you could perhaps, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> if you could please put your videos off, um, I think, Fodrick, Patience, Tokunumbwe, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take a question from the chat box now. Oh, okay. Um, who's in charge of the insurance cost for transport? Do you buy or the buy? Hi, please ask everyone just to mute if you're not uh, speaking. Thanks very much. The insurance cost will be dependent on the Incoterm. So depending on what you choose, you will uh, have to pay a certain amount up until your risk stops. So if your risk stops at the border, you'll have to have your insurance up until the border. And then the buyer will have to have their insurance once it goes through the border. So you will have a specific address when you're using your Incoterm, you'll put in a specific address and that's where your risk will stop. But this is what we'll cover next week in real detail so you understand it fully. That will be an important one to cover next time. Thanks very much. <laughs> I almost started uh, speaking with my microphone. Very good. Uh, Wesi Moyo, um, sorry if that's not your full name, but that's what's appearing on my screen. I see your hand. Would you like to just introduce yourself and pose your question? You're on mute. Oh, yeah. There we go. Go ahead. Yes, um, I'm from Malawi. I wanted uh, to request that it would be good to um, include the cost for inspection in South Africa for agriculture products, if it is possible. Thank you. Generally, we wouldn't have a cost for the inspection, but you will get costs for um, the warehousing. So that is something that your clearing and folding will be able um, company will be able to assist you with because they use specific warehouses that's allowed and depending on which border you're coming through, um, the cost will be different. So there is no set cost for it. So we won't be able to offhand tell you, okay, this is how much it will cost you. Unfortunately not. Okay, so you need to be aware that you need to investigate the warehousing cost as part of the process that you that you go through as an exporter in preparing that. Um, okay, then I've got a question from Douglas in Mozambique. He says, we process powdered moringa, ginger, okra, and teas. So I need to know if there is a company uh, who is keen to partner with me. So I think he's looking for a buyer in South Africa. If there are any buyers online, there you go. Douglas is in the chat. Nothing like a free pitch. <laughs> then do you need an exporter's license or is an exporter's code sufficient? Um, my understanding is that the exporter's code is the same as your BURS code. BURS is the same as SARS. Okay, so I'm not sure which yes. country this relates to. Okay, you understand me? Please go ahead. Okay, it will be the same. So you do not need a separate license as long as you've got an exporter's code, but this is up to the country that you're exporting from. So, you know, you will know the requirements. Um, but generally, an exporter's code would... Um, you know, your SARS or BERS should be sufficient. 
Super, thanks, Mary. I'm going to take another question from somebody with their hand up. Masopa um, Mushweshwe, please could you put your video on, unmute yourself, and introduce yourself and ask your question? Hi, I'm Masopa Mushweshwe from Lesotho. I'm producing leather bags. I heard here, Mary, you talked about textile and other agricultural products, but you are not indeed about leather. I want to find out on the VAT. You said we should pay a VAT when we get into South Africa. Are we paying a VAT or is going to be paid to the customer by the customer when he buy from from the sub from my customer, from my client? So and Mary, then Okay. The yes. other part, the another one, it is about import export license. It's been I've been heard about it several times. As from the Soto, we don't know about export, but we have a, a rule of or as only a permit that actually we know about. So we want to find out even from the Soto, do you need us to have an exporter license to export to South Africa? And then Finished leather goods, are they classified under agriculture or as a full product? Okay. okay. So with that, we've got leather goods and uh, export documentation out of Lesotho. Thank you. Uh, we'll okay. Make... So your VAT or any payments will be dependent on the INCO term that you have chosen with the buyer. Generally, it will be paid on the South African side, but that will be dependent on that INCO term. The export license, um, you mentioned that you already have an export license or you don't have an air? No, I, I don't have one, but uh, according one of the, uh, the experts or the agent that is working with uh, USAID he was asking us if we have an export license. And then we say that we don't. We normally have a source of origin. It is provided by our Department of Trade. So we wanted to find out if we are coming okay. to South Africa, is it really, really required or not? And where can I get it from? Okay, so if you are, it, it doesn't matter from our side, but South African side, we do not really worry about whether or not you have an exporter's code. The exporter's code is for your customs, so they can actually uh, record what has been exported from the country, and they'll, they'll know, go back and say, okay, this is the company that has exported. So it's for your own customs and for your own Department of Trade and Industry for them to actually record their own stats. Um, so we will record from our side, the importer side, uh, what we've imported. So our importers will have their code. So it's not a requirement per se from South Africa. It's normally a requirement from customs or your Department of Trade and Industry. Okay. Okay, and right. going back to but leather, leather goods. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your leather goods, you will need to look at um, the state vet uh, because we'll have to look at how processed it is. Um, I will follow up on that because there are requirements for inspections um, because you may need a state vet um, certification and it will most likely be um, uh, inspected, but also they are, it depends on how much of cargo you're sending. You know, if you're sending it up to, I think, $5,000 or for personal use. So if you are exporting directly to me and I'm only ordering one handbag, then you don't really necessarily need to worry about these documents. But if you are exporting to a company that's going to sell on your behalf, then yes, you will need to have these documents. But I can follow up further on that. Okay, super. So I think on leather goods, it's uh, it is quite an important sector for quite a few uh, companies. So I think it will be quite nice to have that in the toolkit. So thanks for going to to check that one, Mary. Um, I see lots of hands, and I've also got a lot of questions in the chat. So I'm going to take another one from the chat quickly. Mm hmm. There's a question: Is there a possibility of in-country training, especially targeting youth and women groups? Um, I think I can answer that question. Um, we, as the USA Trade Hub, would like to empower our uh, business membership organization and 
trade promotion service provider partners to be able to deliver training like this. That's part of the um, reason for having the toolkit and uh, having videos that will be produced at some stage on this. So the idea is that they can be disseminated in the different countries that we work in using videos, using the toolkit, and obviously this recording will also be available. So uh, that can be available to, to women's groups and to youth. So it certainly there's lots of scope for that. Uh, question here, the presentation has been insightful and rich for some of us that are new in the export import business. I would like to know if there will be a follow up platform created for us to interact with each other to explore the product offerings from other colleagues and look forward to trade synergies. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Um, I think that's something that we need to take up as USA Trade Hub. Um, I know there are some small subgroups that have participated in different trade shows, but there's nothing formal that's been established. I do also know that there's work underway to link uh, trade and investment promotion agencies and business membership organizations at a regional level, and that that might be something that could stem from that. So there is work underway in that regard. Okay, I think I'm going to take another question from one of our very enthusiastic participants, Reginaldo Suto. I see you are on screen. <laughs> Please, can you unmute, introduce yourself, and pose your question? Reginaldo? Okay, while he's coming on screen, um, let's go to Mushweshwe, uh, Moshe at Sishweshwe Productions. <laughs> and the first time I saw your name, I said Sishushu. True, Whitey, comment that one. Please introduce <laughs> yourself and pose the question. <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. Um, we are very, very keen to export to South, African, to South African market, to SARAC market, but the only problem that we experience, particularly here in Lesotho, is uh, the longer process that we take to apply for exporters code. So uh, if uh, a city hub uh, can help, because, uh, it has been a year and six months since we have made an uh, application for exporter scope with uh, South African Revenue Services, but until today, we are yet to obtain the exporter scope. So I wanted to know if, is there any way that we can help us in this regard? Uh, um, did I hear you correct? Did you say that you uh, applied for an exporter's code with South African Revenue Service? Is it maybe an importer's code, um, just to clarify that? Moshe? You're on mute. I think maybe let's treat it as an importer's code, Mary. Oh, there we go. She's going to Yes, it is, an, it is an exporter's code. Uh, when we across our goods uh, across the border to South Africa, we are required uh, to produce an exporter's code. So since it's about a year and a half since we made that application, so we wanted to know if uh, in any way can uh, trade, trade and uh, investment hub uh, assist uh, on this matter or what processes might be followed to obtain such a document. Okay, if I got you right, you're looking for an exporter's code from the South African um, customs. Yes. You will not, if you're a Lesotho business, you will not be able to get an exporter's code from South Africa. Uh -huh. You will only be able to get a, an exporter's code from your Lesotho customs or your Department of Trade and Industry. When you're coming into South Africa, you'll need to deal with a South African company. Mm -hmm. um, so they will not process uh, an exporter's code for someone that's based in Lesotho. Okay. Um, and that's the reality because you are, it's, you know, um, the South African Revenue Service will cover South African companies. So if you're not mm -hmm. a South African company, they will not provide an exporter's code for you. All right. That's a crystal clear. 
So basically what happens is you've got your business in Lesotho that needs an yes. export code and you've got the, the importer sitting in South Africa and they're a registered company in South Africa and they get an importer's code from from customs, from SARS. Um, and that's how they s connect. So yes. thank you for the question. I think it's very good for new okay. importers and exporters to understand that uh, that point. Um, Katleha, I do see your hand. I will come to you. I just want to take one more from the chat. In fact, um, we scheduled this call to be an hour and a half, if I may ask your indulgence, just to keep going until 3.30 with questions. So another five minutes, because we've got quite a few. And then we will do the close after that. So we'll run about 10 minutes late. If you need to drop off, we understand um, the session is being recorded and it will be shared. The link will be shared with all the participants, all the registrants, uh, and it will be available on our website. You can also reach out to your country rep if you need more information. Um, so let me take a few more questions very quickly. Tony and Guni, um, he's from Zambia. He says, thank you for the excellent presentation. I'd like to know in the export market, how is the price of commodities determined or is it determined by the exporter or is there a fixed price for goods? Okay, it's not determined necessarily by the exporter. It's obviously determined by the market you're in and the market you're trying to enter. So if you're looking at exporting to South Africa, you will look at the price that's acceptable to the South African buyer. But also you'd have to consider what your costs are for producing the goods and so on. So you will actually look at all your current costs and you look at what it costs you per unit or per kg or per ton or whatever it is. Um, and then look at whether your price is market related. So sometimes your price may be way below market related and then you can you know, increase it. But if it's above, then you're gonna have a problem. Um, so you really have to look at the market that you're in, the market that you want to enter. So you know, when we're looking at prices, you know, it's going back to demand and supply. So there might be a high demand for a certain product here in South Africa and you could get a premium price for it. Um, so it really is, you know, market related, your demand, your supply for that specific product itself. So it's not really up to the exporter generally. Um, you know, you take in a lot of things when you're looking at pricing your product. Um, and the main thing is the market price and whether it's realistic for your business to export at that price. Because, you know, you could get a big order at a low price, but then that could also put you out of business. So these are the things that you need to consider. Mm. Thanks, Mary. I think I just want to also come in there because I think it's really important to do your research. If you want to import into South Africa, you need to, if it's a retail product, go and look online. A lot of the retailers in South Africa publish their prices. If you sell corned beef, go and look at what ShopRite sells it for. And then you've got to realize that they're going to need to make a margin on that and you've got to discount yours for their margin. Um, so when you price, consider what the retail price is, build in all the costs, understand your costs to, to develop the product. Um, do that research. If you walk into a meeting with a buyer and you don't know what kind of prevailing prices are in the market, it's really going to put you at a disadvantage in terms of how to uh, approach the discussion. Um, I'm going to quickly take another question from the a chat box. I'm hoping this recording, the session is being recorded. It is and it will be shared. Um, I'm looking to import cashew nuts from Mozambique and was interested in hearing how to go about it and who to connect with. Please connect with your country representative in Mozambique. Her name is Honorata Chipepo. We will share the contact details at the end of the session. Um, so please stay online. Um, Sorry, Francis, they want to import from, so are they based in South Africa? If so, they should be contacting USA Trade Hub in South Africa. Ah, thank you, you're quite right. So then you need to speak to Cosmos Mamunzi and his details will also be um, on the... Okay, based in Botswana, so yes. Okay, so... Yeah, that it is. <laughs> then it's actually falling outside of our mandate because we both... <laughs> What's into South Africa, but please chat to your country rep in Botswana um, and we can see how we can be of assistance. Then I manufacture marshmallows, but I did not see any confectionery products on the product lists. How do I go about selling abroad? 
OK, that's quite a broad question. I would recommend that you again reach out to your country representative in whichever country you are based in. Uh, again, we'll share that list at the end. Katlejo, you've been so patient. Your hand is there. Your arm must be so tired by now. Please come onto the stage. Put your video on. Hi, Francis. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, first of all, I just want to maybe let, let me introduce myself. My name is Katlejo Mokheti. I'm the founder and director of an entrepreneurship development program called Market Players uh, in Botswana. And um, I just first want to thank the Hub for hosting this webinar because I think uh, one of the biggest challenges that we've been having is the information gaps. Um, late last year, we we we, we had an, a, a seminar and the Hub was there and the U.S. Uh, ambassador was there. And the more we talked and the government stakeholders were there, the more we talked and engaged, the more we realized that the problem really is that the entrepreneurs don't understand um, the requirements and uh, for, for, for Botswana in particular, you know, our entrepreneurs don't understand the rule of origins, the technical regulations. And I think um, the hub needs to maybe help us in terms of disseminating the information in a way that is uh, broken down because um, a lot of what is being presented here is a great presentation and we, we really appreciate it. But uh, I think we need to break down the jargon so that it's more comprehensive to the average entrepreneur. So the challenge that we are having in Botswana with Botswana entrepreneurs is you, they, uh, we've got entrepreneurs sitting with products you know that are like natural uh, in, and indigenous products like your devil's claw your moringa your marula oils and they are not able to export them and I, I I'm, I'm just not entirely convinced that the hub is, is is really reaching out to entrepreneurs in Botswana to help them understand and to help them uh, leverage the, 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 the platform. So I kind of want to put you on the spot, Mary and Francis, to say um, we've got a radio program in Botswana. I want to invite you um, to come and speak to to, to our, our entrepreneurs in Botswana, help them understand some of the, the, the processes because as much as we've got this webinar, we've got issues of internet connection Activity in Botswana, the average entrepreneur in any corner of Botswana can't access this information. So how do we make it easier for them to hear it, to um, marinate in it and really understand it and be able to action it? So with the radio program, it's nationwide. Everyone has a, every home household has a radio. Uh, uh, and we think uh, if we can get you on radio uh, and you'll be able to um, advance this toolkit. So my intention really right now is to put you on the spot and say, please come and speak to entrepreneurs in Botswana, help them understand this information, break it down. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry, I'm cutting you. We're just running a bit short on time. Thanks for your uh, passion. Um, I think let's pick up that discussion through Gerrit Streif, our country rep in Botswana. Um, we can certainly look into how we can support the, the spreading of this information because that's exactly what the purpose of, of this uh, whole activity is about. And thank you for suggesting radio as a distribution channel for doing that. I think it's, um, it's a channel that we probably don't think of that much these days. Um, I was about to close the floor, but now our our chief of party has his hand up, so I cannot ignore Dr. Golden Mahove. Please, Golden, <laughs> please join me uh, on screen. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Francis, and uh, uh, thanks a lot, Mary, for covering the session and all the great questions coming from the colleagues. I, I just wanted to weigh in on Katlejo's uh, suggestion, which is great. But I also want to temper expectations and say the USA Trade Hub will try as much as possible to support firms that are export ready or near export ready. It will not always be possible to work with each and every entrepreneur in every country, which is why we partner with the national institutions so that as we generate this material, we put it in the hands of the national institutions. So we expect that the export firms should be demanding of their partner trade promotion uh, service providers, business membership organizations to make use of this material and disseminate it to their members within their respective countries. The USA Trade Hub is a project. It will be here today, it may not be there tomorrow. 
but your business membership organizations are there to stay and help them to become more relevant uh, by asking them to do what they should be doing. And we are here to support them to make sure that they do a good job. Thank you very much. Thanks, Golden. I think that's really key. Um, and that was my earlier message as well in terms of the importance of us working with business membership organizations and trade promotion partners in country. It's uh, it's really an important sustainability aspect and also uh, enables more inclusiveness because we can only really work with export ready or near export ready firms. I think I'm going to leave it there. I know there are a few questions that have been answered, not too many. Uh, what we will commit to doing is um, answering those questions in writing. So please keep them coming into the chat group. Uh, this chat box is open, so you can keep uh, putting questions in here as you think of them. Uh, and when we distribute the presentation and the video link, we can share the answers to the remaining questions that were not covered. Um, verbally now. Um, Mary, thank you so much for your excellent presentation and sharing your knowledge with us for all the work you've been doing in the last few months. Uh, we're getting great feedback already um, from different people on this session, so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hand over to Tsipiso Tefo. He's going to share uh, a few next steps, the information on how to get hold of your country rep and also where to get this and other webinar recordings. So, uh, Tsipiso, please put your video on and over to you. Maybe I should introduce Tsipiso more fully. He's a program assistant in the South African cluster at the USA Trade Hub. If you haven't received an email or a phone call from him already, I'm shocked because the man is connected. And he has been with the USA Trade Hub since about August 2019. Uh, over to you, Tsipiso. Uh, many thanks, Francis, for the kind introduction and moderating the session so smoothly. I uh, would like to thank everybody for participating in the webinar, and it is uh, with your contribution to the surveys and interviews that we could deliver. We as the USA Trade Hub could deliver such insightful and rich content on exporting to the processes to South Africa. Um, my takeaway from, from the session was uh, I like how there was emphasis on investing into business and product readiness. Colleagues, can we mute mics? I think they're muted now to be sure. You can go ahead. Uh, I think you're also. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was saying uh, I'd like to highlight some key takeaways that came out on uh, having good side of business and product readiness before uh, 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 exporting or attempt to export to SA, as this would eliminate what we at the USA Trade Hub like to call uh, the school fees for exporting. So these are the blind spots and processes and procedures that may not have been in our site and end up costing, having high, heavy costs on our business in processes while exporting to, to from the region into South Africa. Uh, just a quick reminder to everybody, as Francis said, uh, the presentation and the videos will be uploaded on the USA Trade Hub at www.satihub.com. At, uh, uh, the toolkit upon completion and the spreadsheets on uh, in court terms and the likes will also be available uh, on the website among other various resources. Uh, you are muted, Sapisa. Hello. Somebody's muting you. <laughs> <laughs> We heard you up until the point where you were talking about the upcoming events. Please go ahead. Oh, OK, great. Thank you. Um, the second part of the regional cross-border toolkit 
will be uh, presented on the 16th of uh, March. Uh, this, as discussed, will be covering in court terms, international contra contracts and payment methods. Uh, then after that, we have the Specialty Food Live 2021 Marketing and Branding Feedback Session for firms and uh, that exhibited at the Specialty Food Live event and those interested in participating in, in getting feedback from for participation at US based trade shows. Uh, on the 26th of March, we have the regional learning event in collaboration with the Eastern Cape Development Corporation. And thereafter, on the 31st of March, we have a webinar on financial service providers, which is a workshop to reflect and pave a sustainable way forward. So we look forward to hosting you to more webinars that will be coming. Uh, and for any additional questions, feedback, or access to services uh, towards export development that the USA Trade Hub provide, you can please contact your relevant uh, country representative. Uh, their contact details are on screen for you to note. Uh, I think we can keep it on screen so that everybody does not rush and has enough time to capture their con uh, country representative contact details. With that being said, I thank you very much, everybody, for being here with us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, Tapisa. I'm sorry for not giving you the last word. <laughs> if you have any questions that you specifically would like addressed next week on the 16th on ENCO terms, contracting or finance or something that we did not cover today, Please also feel free to reach out to your country rep with those or post them in the chat. We will be looking out for them. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good afternoon and evening.